Yes, indeedy, folks. It's the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Modern Mac, the man who knows how to juggle it all, all the time, is proud to present Signs of Our Times, proof positive that it's all going to heck in a handbasket if this is all the better we can do. This week's sign of our times was sent to your friend Modern Mac by a friend from the internet. Modern Mac is so with it. This sign was so important that the person who put it up went and used duct tape around the entire thing to make sure it stayed in place. A finely crafted sign it includes an excellent illustration of a missing bike. Please note, the illustration is drawn from memory and may not be to scale. One of the signs of any excellent sign is that it gives full disclosure. Like all excellent signs, this sign gives a complete description of what has happened. My bike was stolen from my front lawn last week. It's a one-speed bike with a skull flag and a lightning bolt on it. The lightning bolt and the flag may have been removed. This bike was brand new from the store. Like all excellent signs, this sign lets you know what they want done. No reward. I don't even want this bike back. I just made these flyers to tell you that I hate you, bike thief. I hope you ride my bike without a helmet and get hit by a monster truck. I hope my bike takes you straight to hell. An excellent example of a sign of our times, if I ever saw one. Your host, Modern Mac, has this to say to the person who posted this sign. Come on, buddy. We're your pals here. No need to hold back. Tell us how you really feel. It is time to explore a road less traveled. The mighty Columbia River, as it stretches from Hermiston and Umatilla over to Portland. Some of us remember when there was a small highway that took all day, and sometimes two, to drive to Portland. Now, we have a freeway and can easily do the drive in eight or nine hours. While we are driving the freeway, we look across to the Washington side and we see a small road over there. It is that road that we will be exploring in the next couple of weeks. However, by way of looking at unusual sites on the drive to Portland, we're going to look today at Highway 205 and particularly Oregon City. My friend and I were returning from Beaverton and we happened to see a little pullout on the freeway that you see when you're headed east and north. You cannot access this pullout from the freeway when you're headed toward the west or toward the south. Harold and I had the occasion to stop by this pullout both in the middle of March and in the middle of October 
2009. I'm sure as we look at these photographs, you'll be able to tell which season was which. Here's a little sample of the spring runoff and the colors. And here's a little sample of the fall runoff and the colors. What this delightful turnout overlooks is Willamette Falls. Willamette Falls is 26 miles above the mouth of the Willamette River at the Columbia River, and the West Bank, where Oregon City is now, had been used as a fishing village by the natives of this area for many, many years before recorded history began. In the winter of 1828-29, John McLaughlin of the Hudson Bay Company claimed the land at Oregon City and called it Willamette Falls. In 1844, Willamette Falls became the first incorporated city west of the Rocky Mountains. The city served as the territorial capital of Oregon from 1843 to 1852, and it has been the continuous county seat of Clackamas County since those times. John McLaughlin became a citizen of the United States and the first mayor of Oregon City. He was so helpful to early missionaries and the pioneers on the Oregon Trail that he became known as the father of the Oregon country. the water coming over these falls was an attraction to early settlers. The water falling over the falls was used to power a lumber mill in 1842, a flour mill in 1844, a woolen mill in 1864, and the first 
paper factory in the Pacific Northwest in 1867. In 1889, water was run through turbines and the power was shipped to Portland. It was the first commercial long distance delivery of power in the United States. Needless to say, as soon as people started settling the Willamette Valley, these falls became a bothersome barrier to transportation. In 1873, locks were hewn out of the rock so that ships and barges could make it around this cataract. The locks have a total lift of 50.2 feet a little over 50 feet. The original locks were built for Stopping by the Willamette Falls Overlook across from Oregon City. What a great way to start a drive heading back to Boise. <music> Yahoo and Wowsy Dowsy! We have a big celebration coming up, folks. It is the biggest. It is the humongousest. It is the gargantuanest. It is the wowsy dowsy who would a thunkinest. Make sure and be aware that it's coming along. Be to the point. And be a regular party of activity. Don't forget to be watching for it. Have your eyes wide open. Make sure your eye is on the ball. Have your peepers a peepin'. And have your specs a speculating. Because it's going to be spectacular. Stretch whatever you need to make sure you get to see this. You won't believe your eyes. It's coming and there's no stopping it, folks. Yes, indeedy, folks, your beer-drinking guide to the Great Wahoo will be sending your way, free of charge, the 100th Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. It's not to be missed. Can you believe it? 100 shows, one right after the other, week after week. So be sure and tune in next week. Yes, next week, Thursday, 
April 1st, 2010. Yes, it's not just the 100th show, it's April Fool's Day. Everybody's favorite day. But this ain't no foolin' around. Your beer drinking guide ain't pulling your leg, folks. The 100th episode of the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo is next week, April 1st. And to follow the lead of the mighty in the television industry, your beer drinking guide is giving away Rolls Royce. Phantoms. Yes, folks, Rolls Royce Phantoms. One free for everybody who is in the studio audience for the 100th show of the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. The 100th show of the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Don't miss it. Next week, right here on TV CTV Channel 11. And now, another exciting adventure checking out an SOB. It's another Sights of Boise. Today on Sights of Boise, we're going to look back to a beautiful cloud-filled day. A lovely sunny day, one of the first ones we'd experienced in a while. It was Friday, the 5th of February, 2010. Living in a desert, we were not used to weeks and weeks and weeks of living under a cloudy sky. Yet that's what we had been doing up until this beautiful day. I went outside to check on my snowbells, or what some people call snowdrops. They are always the first plant to bloom in the spring. Sometimes they come up in the middle of January. I had seen them budding out for a while, and here on this beautiful sunny day, they were blooming. What a joy. The Narcissus were also poking up through the ground. And, much to my surprise, a primrose that I had planted a few years earlier had once again returned. I didn't know these guys were so hardy, and I didn't know that they came out so early. A month later, on the 3rd of March, the primroses were really shining on their glory. Here in March, the snow bells that were on the sunny side of the house had already passed into making seeds and forgetting about being a flower. However, I went to the shady side of the house and found a single snow bell not looking terribly healthy. He was a little ways away from a couple snow bells. And those snow bells were in front of the whole forest of snow bells that loved this shady side of the house. They always bloom about a month after the snow bells that are on the sunny side of the house. They bloom about the time I see these guys blooming out by the garage. Now you know spring has arrived when you see the daffodils. But let's get back to our story, shall we? The story was from February 5th, a Friday, a wintry day, a nice sunny one. I found myself walking across the Americana Bridge, looking upstream. 
I'm sure you all recognize this concrete dam that diverts water into the settler's canal. I couldn't help but stop and enjoy the clouds in the sky and the water percolating over the dam. It was running fairly well, but certainly not at summertime flows. They had cleared all the brush out that usually fills all these little square holes up, and the water was running nice and easy and free over all of the little uh, square openings in the dam. All of them, that is, except one. I happened to notice that this one little square hole in the dam, instead of the water running free and clear over it, it was constantly agitated in little waves that broke the water up and seemed to fill it with air bubbles. If you look right on the top edge, you can see where the water is being broken into little waves, as opposed to all of the rest of the openings, which come over smoothly and don't break the water up as it cascades down. Here's a little close-up of what the water looked like coming through 11 of the openings. And here's the one that I noticed that the water coming over was chopped up. I got curiouser and curiouser about how this could be happening. So I walked down by the little diversion dam and took a look in the river. It's very seldom that we see this diversion structure without limbs and branches backed up against these openings in the dam. Just as I suspected, a little branch had gotten caught just an inch or two below the surface. As it vibrated in the water, it agitated the water just enough to give the water that little wave that created the texture as the water flowed over the dam. The water without the little stick vibrating and the water with the little stick vibrating. Oh, beautiful sunny days in February. They give us a chance to check out the smaller things in life. my friends, they give beer drinking guides something to fill up a half an hour worth of television with. I like it. It was a beautiful spring day out on the farm. Farmer Frank's spread wasn't a very big one, just a few acres, but he managed to eke by, and he was enjoying puttering around out in the barnyard on a beautiful Tuesday afternoon. About 3.30, Frank saw a car pull in that he'd never seen before. A rather dapper gentleman got out of the car and introduced himself. Howdy, he said. My name's Phil. I'm from the State Labor Board, and to tell you the truth, we've got some reports that you've got people working here that you're not paying a proper wage. Well, said Farmer Frank, I don't know about not paying them proper wages. I do have a few people working for me. To which Phil replied, well, why don't you just tell me who you got working for you? and I'll determine whether you're paying them properly or not. So Frank says, well, I got me a hired hand. He's kind of a young guy, not good for much, but he does help out. I pay him $300 a week plus room and board. I guess I'm paying him okay. He's been working here for three years. Well, Phil just jumped right in and says, 
Well, so who else you got working here? So Farmer Frank, he fessed up and he says, and I've got me a cook. She's pretty good. She's kind of slow, but she knows how to make good pies. I'll say that for her. Now I pay her $150 a week, plus of course, free room and board, just like my other help. And I don't know, she seems to like it. She's been here, oh, I guess 17 or 18 months now. Well, said Phil, two, is that all you got is two people working around here? Farmer Frank admitted, well, I do have this fool working around here. I must admit he works hard. He works about 18 hours every day. And he does about 90% of all the work around here. Oh, really, said Phil. And what do you pay him? Well, said Farmer Frank, I must admit he, he makes about $10 a week and he pays his own room and board. And I do buy him a bottle of bourbon every Saturday night. And, if the truth be told, he gets a little friendly with my wife every long once in a while. Aha, said Phil. Ten dollars a week? That's the guy I want to talk to. I want to talk to this fool that you're talking about. Well, said Farmer Frank, you're talking to him. <laughs>